it's um the secret meeting that changed rap music and destroyed a generation. Damn. So she says, hello. <clears throat> After more than 20 years, I finally decided to tell the world what I witnessed in 1991, which I believe was one of the biggest turning points in popular music. And ultimately, American society. I have struggled for a long time weighing the pros and cons of making my story public as I was reluctant to implicate the, the individuals who were present that day. Mm. So I've simply decided to leave out the names and all the details that may risk my personal well-being and that of those who were, like me, dragged into something they weren't ready for. <clears throat> Damn. Hold on, let me... Uh... So we're going to tell a story. We're going to tell a story. We ain't scared. You know what I'm saying? What they going to do? They after us, not scared. <laughs> <laughs> look, black man. <laughs> so look. So he says, between late, between the late 80s and early 90s, I was what you may call a decision maker with one of the more established companies in the music industry. I came to Europe in the early 80s and quickly established myself in the business. The industry was different back then since technology and media weren't accessible to people like that, like they are today. The industry had more control over the public and had the means to influence them any way it wanted. Right. This may explain why in early 1991, I was invited to attend a closed door meeting with a small group of business, with business insiders to discuss rap music's new direction. Hmm. Rap music's new direction. Yeah. Little did I know, we would be asked to participate in one of the most unethical and destructive business practices ever seen. Crazy. So said, so, so this was the meeting. The meeting was held at a private residence on the outskirts of Los Angeles. I remember about 25 to 30 people were 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 being there. Right. Most of them familiar faces. Speaking of those I knew, we joked about the theme of the meeting as many of us did not care for rap and failed to see the purpose of being invited to a private meeting to the get, to to discuss the future of hip hop. Talk to him. Among the attendees was a small group of unfamiliar faces who stayed to themselves and made no attempt to socialize beyond their circle. Based on their behavior and formal appearances, they didn't seem to be from our industry. Our casual our casual chatter was interrupted when we were asked to sign the confidentiality agreement preventing us from publicly discussing the information presented during the meeting. Hmm. Needless to say, this intrigued, in some cases, disturbed many of us. The agreement was only a page long, but very clear on matters and consequences, which stated that violating the terms would result in job termination immediately. We asked several people what this meeting was about and the reason for such secrecy, but could not find anyone who had the answers for us. A few people re refused to sign and walked out. Nobody stopped them. I was tempted to follow, but but curiosity got the best of me. That's right. A man who was part of the unfamiliar group collected all the agreements from us. So now it's going to get to the good part because the meeting about to start. Talk to him, Jake. <clears throat> it says, quickly after the meeting began, hold on one second. Get your popcorn, y'all. Popcorn, get your pistol. No, sweat. For real, um, though. <laughs> quickly after this meeting began, one of the industry colleagues who shall remain nameless like everybody else thanked us for attending. He then gave the floor to a man who only introduced himself by first name and gave no other details about his personal background. Mm. I think he was the owner of the residence, but that was never confirmed. He briefly praised all of us for the success we had achieved in our industries and congratulated us for being selected as a part as part of this small group of decision makers. At this point, I began to feel slightly uncomfortable in the strangeness of this gathering. The subject quickly changed as the speaker went on to tell us that the respective companies we represented had invested in a very profitable industry, which could become even more rewarding with our active involvement. Damn. He explained that the companies we worked for had invested millions into millions into the building of privately owned prisons and that our positions of influence in the music industry would actually impact the profitability of these investments. Hmm. Then he says, 
I remember many of us in the group immediately looking at each other in awe and confusion. At the same time, I didn't know what a private prison was, but I wasn't the only one. Sure enough, someone asked this, someone asked what these prisons were and what any of this had to do with music. <clears throat> we were told that these prisons were built by privately owned companies who receive funding from the government based on the number of inmates. Mm -hmm. The more inmates, the more the government would pay these prisons. Mm -hmm. It was also made clear to us that since these prisons are privately owned, as they become publicly traded, we'd be able to buy shares. Most of us were taken back by this. Again, a couple of people asked what this had to do with us. At this point, my industry colleague who had first opened the meeting took the floor again and answered our questions. He told us that since our employees had become solid investors in this prison business, it was now in their interest to make sure that these prisons remain filled. Our job would be to help make this happen by making music which promote criminal behavior, mm. rap being the music of choice. Mm. He assured us that this would be a great situation for us because rap music was becoming an increasingly profitable market for our companies. And as employees, we'd also be able to buy stocks in these prisons. Immediately, silence came over the room. You could have heard a pin drop. Hmm. I remember looking around to make sure I wasn't dreaming and saw half of the people with dropped jaws. My days was interrupted when someone shouted, is this a fucking joke? At this point, things became chaotic. Right. Two of the men who were part of the unfamiliar group grabbed the man who shouted and, and attempted to remove him from the house. A few of us, myself included, tried to intervene. One of them pulled out a gun, put out a gun, and we all backed off. They separated us from the crowd, and all four of us was escorted outside. My industry colleague, who opened up the meeting earlier, hurried out to meet us and reminded us that we had signed an agreement and would suffer the consequences of speaking out about this publicly or even those who attended the meeting. Damn. I asked him, why was he involved with something so corrupt? And he replied, it's bigger than the music business and nothing we can do. And, oh, no, no, no. It's bigger than the music business and nothing we want to challenge without risking consequences. We all protested as the as they walked, as we walked back into the house. I remember word for word the last thing he said, "It's out of my hands now. Just remember, you signed an agreement." He then closed the door behind him. The men rushed us to our car and actually waited until we drove off the property. Damn. So. So uh, this meeting, bro. Now that's a lot for a meeting right there. Oh yeah. Definitely. You know, and this person later on, he said, you know, this person actually ended up leaving the music industry after this happened. Well, a, f a few years after this, he ended up leaving the music industry. OK. And um, he'd say he just like, you know, over the years, he just he just felt guilty because he said as he sat back and he watched these plans come into play, come to a reality over two decades, he sat back and was like, wow, they really pulled it off. Yeah, they really pulled this off. He was like they were told not to sign any more political rappers, any any more rappers that had messes in their no music. No positivity. It was all to be gangster rap music that they promoted and 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 put out. So if you wonder where and Brand Nubians went, us. if you wonder where Brand Nubians went, where Poor Righteous Teachers went, where Public Enemy went, where KRS One went, and all sorts of groups like that that was talking, yeah. pre, even Queen Latifah and Moni Love and those, you know, everybody. What I'm saying? It, 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 yeah. it's a back door. Yeah, anything that was harmless, fun rap, you know, anything that had a message in it had to go. Yeah, that's you know why if saying? you even notice, though. Not even, we talk about that all the time. Even be brief with it. You know, what I'm saying? Uh, those charms that came out like maybe 1988, 89, the African mm -hmm. charms, those those disappear. They lasted for about two years and they disappear real quick. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, definitely, Quickly. definitely. Now, after reading all this, you know, it actually made me feel a few different ways. The first emotion I felt was shocked because I was definitely taken back by this, just knowing the level of evil that's involved by even even thinking of a plan like this. You know right. what I'm saying? The second emotion I felt was anger. Anger because it's not enough for them to exploit our culture 
and make all the money off of it. Mm -hmm. Because let's keep it real, the industry has never been favorable towards the artists. Never. never. But they're going to go beyond the artists to get the artists to influence and lure in the consumer, which they knew at the time were mainly minorities. Yep. In other words, keep promoting gangster rap so that the youngsters will be influenced by them, which in turn will incite them to want to act like them. And it's very and it's a very good chance they'll end up in their prison. Yeah. So they're getting paid twice. They're getting paid from the artists they sign in, and then they're getting paid from the from the the people that these artists influence that goes to prison trying to be like these artists. Yeah. So they 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 making a killing. A killing. They're using the music business to promote their private prison business. Uh, it, my man is right right there talking that right. 1988, a man named Tom Beasley, man, that's the co-founder of the, uh, the, the, um, the, uh, the, the, the corrections, the corrections for California, the corrections for Corporation of America. That's the CCA. You know what I'm saying? Excuse my French. I'm reading this thing right there real quick. It's the CCA. So in 1988, he founded that. And this, this is in uh straight, straight, uh, concert with the same thing. So it's like the music business. You do what you do on your side. And right. over here with the correction <laughs> facilities, we're going to do on this side because and now in 1970, there was 500 prisons. You know what I'm saying? Only 500 prisons in the United States. D to this day, there's 1,700 prisons right now. Mm. That means big business. I'm talking about that. Then flip it over. You know what I'm saying? If, if flip it over is a word yeah. because they're making a lot of money off of these things per inmate. You know what I'm saying? So getting with this, with the same thing of the of the music, it all it all went hand in hand. And we just end up, we just partying at the same time. So... Us as the artists is the tool they use. Yeah. The music is the bait. Yep. And the young consumers are the prey. It's a cold game. Cold game, bro. Cold you know game. Then I feel sad. Sad because everything we seem to try to create, we always seem to give it away. We're always yeah. being tricked and deceived into believing that they have our best interests at hand when clearly they never have and they never will. They never will have our best interests at hand. Every is is blow after blow after blow after blow.